Hello and welcome to the Canon Sports Podcast. I am your host, Ryan from Canning Sports, and joining me today, the head coach of the Marymount High School volleyball team, number one in the nation, 27-0, and Carrie Klein. Carrie, Hi. thank you so much for joining the podcast. Thank you. It's How very are you? exciting. It's very exciting. How have you been? Great. Awesome. Great. Uh, so let's start at the start. Where are you from? I'm from Irvine, California, and I grew up playing volleyball for Orange County Volleyball Club and Irvine High. I was like in ballet, and my dad got sick of watching <laughs> the ballet shows, and obviously I was growing, 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 probably like eight inches in one year, and I was became horrible at the ballet. Um, so he he was a big sports booster at UC Irvine, and he had a free volleyball camp. So um, I did that. And from then on, you know, loved it. Yeah. So volleyball from a pretty early age was Yeah, like sport. sixth grade, okay. which is young, really young back then. But now, you know, sixth grade girls, fifth grade girls are yeah. kind of starting the sport. Interesting. So grew up in Irvine, Irvine High School then? IHS, the Caros, <laughs> yes. So I took some notes. I looked you up on the internet, as one can do these days. Irvine High School state champions? Yes. What year was that? That was 80. Well, I graduated in 88, so it must have been 87. Was you know, your, the fall. It was, yeah. it was the fall of right, my senior right. year. Right, right. The fall of senior year, state champions. It wow. And and I have it down. one of the greatest games ever. We played, like, our best friends, you know, Newport Harbor. Okay. And um, we were down. It was just, like, one of those great games. Five-set match? Five-set match. And yeah. just that feeling of you weren't supposed to win, but you won, wow. you know, so that was great. And I have it down that you were named the 1988 California Most Valuable Player. I, I think so. <laughs> I'm not positive <laughs> on that, but yeah. Amazing. So uh, uh, so you started playing in sixth grade. At what age did you know, like, I have something? I, I cried the whole sixth grade year, and yeah. my mom tried to say, like, don't play again. Like, all you did was cry after practice, before practice, and I'm like, no, I was having a good time. And yeah. she's like, okay, like one more year. And, you know, and then it took me all of seventh grade to make a serve over the net. Yeah. Like I still couldn't overhand serve. Yeah. And the little girls that we have like playing now in Sunshine and stuff, they're like tiny and they're, they're making, they're bombing serves. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think it was like halfway through seventh grade mm -hmm. or like maybe seventh grade at the end of the year something clicked. I was so skinny. I was so weak. But then I just started to kind of, I, I liked it the whole time, but I guess I was crying and horrible. <laughs> um, but I didn't really understand that. Yeah. I think uh, I played soccer when I was around that age, like fifth, sixth grade. And I also cried, <laughs> but I think I used to cry because my dad would be on the sidelines yelling at me to run the whole time. And I would, I would have a point in every game where I would turn, look at the sidelines, go shut up dad and then I would get a talking to when we got home yeah that yeah I had like great parents and I also got to be at Irvine High where the Odin sisters which all three of them were on the Olympic team mm -hmm. and so we kind of got to play together even my freshman year like we had a uh I think we have a CIF championship from my freshman year in high oh, school wow. where I got to play and then I was like okay this high school volleyball thing I think I just had a great experience and fell in love with. Is that where it happened? The the, the kind of click of like, this is really like, what I, I want to they're dedicate. announcing the game. And yeah. I'm like, this is just great. Yeah. And um, still, I was still kind of clueless, but I, I loved it. Awesome. And then, so 87 state champs, 88, you're the California most valuable player. And then from there, you go to Pepperdine. Yes. Pepperdine University here in Los Angeles. Well, Malibu. Malibu, yeah. Malibu. What was that like going from high school to college then for you? I, I It was a dream. I just kept looking at that campus. Yeah. And, and then we had such a great team of girls who were all best friends um, and got to play for Nina Matthews. I, I had great coaches along the way. Yeah. And it was just fun. I had a dream like five years ago and I was – woke up and I was like, I was back at Pepperdine <laughs> playing volleyball. And so that is the dream yeah. place to play volleyball. I would imagine. I mean, I went to, so I went to the university of San Diego as we were talking about just before we came on, uh, which is also in the West coast conference. But I remember my senior year in high school visiting Pepperdine and I had had a friend that went to Pepperdine to play water polo. Uh, Grant, if you're listening to this, I'm giving you a shout out. <laughs> um, so I'd went to see one of his games and I just remember being so blown away by the campus and you're right there overlooking like Malibu and the ocean and it's, unreal what was the 
the change in competition that you saw going from like high school to college then? I, I feel like I always got to play at a high level. I was on like a high level club team. And so I think it just was just continuing to grow. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel like that big of a jump, yeah. but it was just felt very exciting. The traveling and um, the going to Texas and, you know, playing UCLA and all these schools. Yeah. And you mentioned club team. So um, like, again, I grew up playing soccer. So like uh, there, you know, club soccer was, you know, obviously you play for your school, but I feel like, you know, the real development was at the club level. I played for the Claremont stars. <laughs> what up? <laughs> um, so what is, is it similar in club volleyball? I mean, is that if for high level volleyball, is it really at the club level that you're going to yeah, be? I mean, when you look at like, like our sunshine team in the area, you've got like the best from Harvard West. Like you've got the best from Maricosta Redondo. You have like, kind of the best players from really almost Southern California now mm -hmm. going to play together. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it ups the level and, and you can train a little bit higher, but I, this Marymount team that I have is, yeah. is, you know, every five of the girls play club together. So sure. it was able to have some consistency there too, but the club season's long. These girls yeah. play a lot of volleyball now. It's gotten longer and more intense. Yeah. Now you've mentioned a couple times the Sunshine Volleyball Club. So if anyone listening or watching this isn't aware, you were a founder of the Sunshine Volleyball yeah, Club? Yeah, and I'm a coach there and yeah. love it. And it's kind of our whole thing between that and Marymount. That's yeah. what I love to do. So what, uh, what got you to want to start a volleyball club? Um, originally I had, um, these neighborhood girls and I had just had a baby mm -hmm. and I was like coaching at another club and I'm like, this is just too much with a baby. And so they were like fifth graders and fourth graders mm -hmm. and they knocked on my door right around the block and yeah. said, you know, we do a team for us. I'm like, okay, I can handle a team for you guys. And then just kind of built, well then like, I'm not going to give them away after right. that year. Like right. I, so so that first group, and I'm still close with a lot of those girls, you know, were just kind of knocking on my door for like wanting me to make a team. Yeah. So felt doable with a little baby and a toddler. Sure. Um, so that's kind of how I built on it. Got it. And at this point, so Sunshine Volleyball Club is still going. How many teams do you guys have now? Ooh, I think we have right around 300 girls. Wow. So, um, and that's kind of all age levels, all age, like probably the youngest are like eight and then to seniors in high school. Got it. Got it. And so what is, so you're saying, you know, that these girls are playing almost a year round. Like what is the, the season like for a club volleyball team? So they have a date that they can start. And I think it's probably like right after Thanksgiving, club can start and mm -hmm. and then the finals will be in the end of june or like july 4th yeah okay and so high school they're saying this year the cif and the state championships has to be done before thanksgiving yeah so you know you have a couple days there where yeah a couple days off and yeah, then you're right back into exactly. the season yeah now marymount high school boy let me just list some of the accolades so you've been the coach at marymount high school Six state titles, seven Southern California titles, eight CIF Southern Section titles. Is that correct? Yeah. Holy cow. When did you first start at Marymount? I started in 98. I know that that's when my daughter was born. Yeah. Um, I think I would, had a newborn at the interview, and then she was a tiny baby that first season. So, yeah. Um, we have, it's been a great time. I, at first, my kids were at in the gym. So they kind of gave me the job knowing I had little kids. Yeah. Chase had a razor scooter that he would skate <laughs> around the gym. There was a TV in the closet. I can, and whoever was hurt had to like read books to the kids. So yeah. it, they made it work for uh, a young mom. Awesome. And what, what was it that made you want to get into coaching? Well, I was an education major at, at Pepperdine and I always wanted to be like a kindergarten teacher and a first grade teacher. And that's what I started to do. Mm -hmm. And then my husband got drafted for, to the Falcons. So we moved across country. And at that point, I was like kind of back and forth. It like a teaching job wasn't like practical, um, even though that's still I say kindergarten teacher is my dream job. Yeah. Um, and then having kids, it's very hard that, I mean, teachers do so much work and it mm -hmm. is, it's a big job. So that kind of morphed into, but I always liked coaching, 
you know, even when I would be at these tournaments, I'd go help the little kids. So teaching and coaching, like when people say they don't know what they want to do or what they want to be, it was like very easy for me. Yeah. I, it's the only thing I'm good at uh, or <laughs> somewhat good at. Well, that and volleyball, it. right? Yeah, volleyball. <laughs> you know, I just like the process of learning something new. Yeah. And, Absolutely. Now, you, you mentioned your husband was drafted by the Falcons. Did you guys meet because of sports? Yeah, we uh, met Marv Marinovich. It's like he's um, his son, Todd Marinovich. Yeah. Um, Marv had a gym in Orange County at the Anaheim Hilton. Mm -hmm. And at this Hilton, it was all like pro athletes or college athletes. The O'Bannon brothers were there. Mm -hmm. It was all guys. But this one dad... Um, I was coaching her. It was, I was going to Pepperdine and I was coaching his daughter, um, in club, just kind of helping out and, uh, Marv owed him money. So he goes, well, <laughs> Marv's going to let you work out. And Marv's like, well, we don't let girls in here, you know, at oh, first. Wow. And he's like, you're going to let her work out. And so I, it was great, you know, lots of fun guys to work out with. And they, and he was at the top of the game. So uh, from then Marv really got into training, girls volleyball players and, mm -hmm. and a ton of other things. But this was at the very start yeah. of I was one of the first girls that allowed in there. Yeah. And as your as your husband started playing in the NFL, what was that like for you being along with him for that journey? Well, it was a short journey, but it was wonderful. Sure. Like, you know, the Atlanta team was just great and the Atlanta community for being like a young couple was just great. And we have like great friends still yeah. from that experience. It, it, it's very easy to move to a new city when you have like a hundred guys on the team. Yeah. Wives, everybody was so nice. But I remember I was coaching at Georgia state, volunteering at Georgia state mm -hmm. as he was playing and I was doing some club stuff. They knew nothing about volleyball. Yeah. Nobody was even interested in volleyball. Girls volleyball was nothing. Now Atlanta is amazing for girls volleyball it's blowing up. They have all these clubs. They're always in top in the country. But at that time, I was like, come on, let's play volleyball. And, you know, kind of bringing it there. It was a big California thing, obviously. Yeah. And it moved to Texas and the Midwest. But when we first got there, there was girls volleyball was like, you know, it was all about cheerleading yeah. in the South at that point. But yeah. they've really taken it on. Very cool. Very cool. Now, so you were volunteering at Georgia State. Yes. And then what year do you guys move back to California? I don't, I'm not positive, but we moved back and I was able to then help out at Pepperdine. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely had 95, my son there. He was born there and like a little guy there. Um, and I came back somewhere before Hannah was born, which was January of 98 mm -hmm. and um, kind of helped out at Pepperdine. And then this Marymount job came up when I was about to have Hannah. I was like, I think I can do Pepperdine with two little kids. Yeah. So like I said, they were flexible with me having my kids there. Yeah. Now when you get to Marymount, what was the state of the program at that time? Uh, I think, you know, the Catholic schools across the country are, are so lucky because they start their girls playing sports in fourth and third grade. Mm -hmm. You look across the country of all the top teams, you're seeing Catholic schools. And, um, so I, I had a great senior class. I had girls that were really excited to, um, win and be coached. So it was a great state to be walking into. They were kind of ready for a, a bit of a change and they were ready to win and, and wanted to compete. So it was awesome. Awesome. And so when you step into that job as the head coach at Marymount, what is the philosophy that you bring or what is the culture that you bring that you wanted to create with that team? Well, I, 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 I kind of didn't know, but I was like starting to hard work, you know, mm -hmm. um, being in shape and, um, more of a disciplined, um, program I'd kind of come from. So I kind of just kind of gave them the standards of college volleyball. And I mm. just, you know, that's where I came from and that's where I put it on. And they're eager. I mean, Marymount's like very academic school. So I think I had to adjust to how smart these girls were. Mm. You know, a lot of it was me adjusting to them, adjusting to their schedule, adjusting to like, these girls are doing a ton of homework. Like I didn't care about home. Like I wasn't <laughs> studying. So I had to grow and I learned a lot from them too. It's a smart group and um, 
they were always had kind of a beach game going. So mm -hmm. that was great. Um, I guess I probably like was like, okay, you're going to be on time. All those little things. If you're not mm -hmm. 15 minutes early, you're late. Um, you know, have the right gear on, you know, just sort of brought a discipline to the program. Yeah. Now going from being a high level player as you were to then becoming a coach, what were some of the adjustments or some of the things that you had to learn along the way in terms of now you're coaching as opposed to, I, I would assume as a player, it's a little easier to, even in a team environment, kind of like you're taking care of yourself, you know what your job is to now as the head coach, you're kind of the overseer of everyone, you're bringing the whole squad along. What were some of the adjustments or some of the, the things you you learned? Well, there's just there's just always a lot of a lot of girls, and everybody has a different story, and you kind of have to reach out to them differently. Um, so that was part of it. I think I was one of those probably like teammates that sort of kind of coach too. I remember my first recollection of coaching somebody who was like me. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm annoying to coach. <laughs> you know, I'm, like, talking too much. Like, I'm, like, pointing out the hitters. I, I, so that kind of gave me um, – I, I just feel like it, it's a pretty easy transition mm -hmm. when you're a teacher. I think most of my stuff really came from classroom management, mm -hmm. all that stuff that you learn in education, you know, like yeah. – you know, look here, wait till everyone's speaking, you know, all those teaching cues. I think coaches use a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Now, and and both my parents were teachers, so I, I definitely know kind of where you're coming from with that. And I think it's probably hugely valuable if you're going to be a coach. Today. It's a huge basis. Yeah, I would imagine so. Now, in dealing with adolescents and tons of different personalities and tons of different learning styles, how have you found it adapting to like, you know, do you, te do you treat everyone the same? Do you treat certain players I, differently? I don't think you can treat everyone the same. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think, and, and I believe in like having assistant coaches and a lot of people say things differently and I'll know, I'll say something, I'll be saying, get your foot on the line maybe. And someone will say, um, it would be great if your foot was a little more <laughs> over here. And then all of a sudden it clicks. Right. So I have to like, really constantly like the drill is designed to teach them something like it's up to me to make the drill work for everybody this year I we have a big team we have 22 girls mm -hmm. and the drills were not clicking and so then I kind of reached out I'm like what why aren't these drills making sense you know kind of complex scoring drills on six on six and they're like well maybe if you put it on the board so then I brought out the chalkboard and okay, now I'm going to use a chalkboard. So I think it's up to you if the drill's not working or if the girls aren't happy or if they're not learning and improving, it's really on you as the coach, you know, to figure out another way, say it differently, show it differently, use another tool. So that's what a good coach should be doing. And I should be doing more than just saying, we're doing this drill, like mm. explain why. And so... Yeah, and clearly it's had success. Now, this year I was looking on Max Preps. Uh, you guys are currently ranked number one in the nation at 27 and 0. Do you, do you feel it when you have a team that, I mean, so you've won a number of titles, uh, both state titles, southern section titles. Uh, do you know it coming in? Is it something that you feel throughout the year? Yeah, and I, we were really excited for last season too because mm -hmm. a lot of these girls started as sophomores. Mm -hmm. And so then there was a core group of seniors that are now freshmen in college. They really thought they had a good shot last year. Mm -hmm. I don't know about number one in the nation, but at least at a state championship and, and going for a CIF championship. So, so that's just been building. And those four that were seniors had to walk away from it. Mm -hmm. And, and the jun they were juniors. They had to sit there yeah. and, and see these guys didn't get it. So, the amount of focus with this group, having not gotten to do it and having to see that those other girls had to walk away from this mm. good thing, like losing in the semifinals as a sophomore, losing in the finals as a sophomore, like it hurt and mm. they thought they could justify it the next year and then they couldn't. Um, so they're, um, they, they bring it up. These girls have an agenda yeah. um, and they, ha and it got just cemented from their sophomore year on, you mm. know, of what they want. Yeah. Now, what is, 
I mean, do you feel it as a coach or do you see it with the players? I mean, being ranked number one, is that something that you feel? Oh, yeah. And it was so funny. Uh, one guy who worked with me, um, he said, you guys made the mistake of telling Carrie that you wanted to win CIF. Because I have that responsibility. Like, I got to look them in the eye. If it doesn't happen, it's my fault. Mm. I didn't train them well enough. So they're, you know, if this is what you want, okay, then I have to back up and here's the game plan. And I looked at them and I'm like, we have to look different. We're going into playoffs. And they're like, Carrie, it looks for We have to look different. In two weeks, we have to have some new plays and some new depth to our offense. We have to evolve. Um, so that's, they give me the goal and I try to make the plan for it mm. or else I've disappointed them. This is their season. They really own it. Yeah. Now, if we can backtrack, not backtrack, but, but pull back a little bit. Um, if anyone who's listening or watching doesn't fully know the game of volleyball and we're talking about college or high school, college, this is indoor volleyball. So it's six people aside. Six people aside, and um, the setter is, you know, jump setting and setting at option of, like, usually four or five people um, running at different tempos. Mm. So there's a complexity on that. Um, there's a libero who can only play back row. Right. She can't jump, and she can't set with her hands in front of the 10-foot line. Um, we're kind of using like a jump float serve mm -hmm. and a top spin, like pounding serve and kind of doing some complex blocking stuff. Uh, three front row, three in the back row, and they have to rotate every time there's a side out. Yeah. Now, uh, growing up, I would play volleyball like at the beach. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm from Southern California as well. So if we would go to the beach as kids, like we would play volleyball or, you know, sometimes in like PE class we'd play. And it was very much just, you get three hits, you get it back on the other side of the net. And then when I went to high school, uh, I went to Damien High School in Laverne. And one of our sister schools was St. Lucie's uh, in all girls high school in Glendora. And we would go to a lot of their volleyball games. And that was the first time I had ever seen volleyball plays being run where you do have multiple people running up on the net Sometimes there was almost like a fake out where the setter yes. would set it and it looks like one girl is coming up and it's the girl on the far side. How do you go about making those plays? Do you make new plays? Do you draw on what has kind of been done before? I mean, what is the process of kind of the X's and O's of volleyball? Well, and that's really the great thing. We have Kelly Velarde, our setter right now, and she has to look like she could set anybody at any point of time. So you really try to get her form and her hands to be in the same place at the same time. And then she's going to look at the other side of the net and see where their blockers are. Mm. Um, so she's always scheming to get a matchup. Okay. There's a five, two girl blocking over there. Yeah. Let's set as far away or um, there. We always call it, um, you know, the Jack and Jill, like the easy set or the hard set. If the ball gets shanked to this side, throw it to the other side. If mm -hmm. it gets shanked to the right, throw it to the left. Um, so we're always working on that. The middle blocker generally runs the really fast plays like that are like, she's in the air when, the, when the setter is actually setting the ball, so she's basically just striking it down and it's up to the setter to put the ball in her hands kind of. Mm -hmm. Um, even when you look at her hitting percentage, it's on the setter almost more like if she's hitting only 100, then you got to look at the sets. Whereas the other balls, the higher balls with more time, the uh, hitting percentage would be more based on the hitter. You know, you yeah. blame the hitter. Like, it's up there. It's your job to do something with it. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're, when you're in the middle of a match, and um, I'm not sure if high school and college have the same, but as far as I know, it's five sets. Yes. Uh, the first four sets, it's first to 25. Win by two, is that correct? Win by two. Win by two. And then if you go to a fifth set, it's first to 15, win by two. Correct. So... And I'm sure you've, you know, with your coaching career, you've been in situations of being down. What are some of the mid-game adjustments that you might make or the mid-match adjustments that you might make? What are some of the things that you look for as, you know, we're down a set or whatever it is, and these are some of the adjustments we need to make? A lot of times it's because the serving and the passing game is getting so technical that I really try to move the serve-receive around. Like, let's have this girl take a step to the right or – or there's some things you can do to change the passer. Obviously, a sub, 
you know, to have, give somebody a break. But more than anything, you want to do the spacing on the serve-receive or who's passing here. Um, so that or a coverage or a new play, um, let's bring the hitter inside or let's bring her outside or that that's mostly it. A lot of times, I mean, it's a big joke with volleyball coaches. I call a timeout. And it's basically to ice that other server, Yeah, you know, and then the coaches get like the team will look at me, nice time out, Carrie, you know, <laughs> so it's calm my team down, but mm-hmm. maybe ice the server. Yeah. That's a lot of volleyball, you know, yeah. like that girl has to think about it and, and she's not on a, such a role where she's just serving really tough. I mean, that's generally things happen bad with that. Yeah. Now it sounds like your team this year is very good at motivating themselves. Yes. Have you had teams in the past that maybe say weren't as good at self-motivating? And if so, what are kind of your strategies as a coach to really get through to your team and to motivate them? Oh gosh. You know, every team involves something different. I, I, you know, you set a goal that hopefully is realistic. You know, every team is different. So sometimes it's, you've got to get 25 points or let's get the first 10 points. And sometimes I, you have to break it into smaller chunks for the team. Mm-hmm. And I think with this team, you kind of have to do maybe go back and remind them because everyone's gunning for them now. So if we can just focus on the first 10 points and let's see if we can run the middle four times or let's see if we can tip three balls over here. Promise me you're going to tip three balls over here. So I'll give them a little goals like that. And at 10, um, we can celebrate. At eight, we can really start to turn the party up. And so I, I break up the score sometimes like mm. that. It helps like little goals. Like by this, I I'm expecting you, the setter Kelly to have five tips and uh, Dior. I, I need you to have four blocks. Mm. Uh, so then I kind of get, sometimes it's just individuals and then they kind of come together. Yeah. Now uh, with, with the club, with Sunshine, are you coaching all levels or are you just coaching high school? Level I, I, now? I am coaching all levels. My husband, Perry, has been taking the, the 10 year olds and the nine year olds. So mm-hmm. then I'll come help him with his practice and his tournaments. I like to work with the little girls too. And, and I, it, with COVID, we had a lot of coaches that weren't coaching. I was coaching, you know, quite a bit. Sure. And so what are the different strategies when, say, you're coaching some of the younger girls, maybe just starting out with a focus maybe on fundamentals versus girls that you've had for, you know, a number of years now that are playing at a more advanced level? What are kind of the differences in the coaching? Well, some of it is just getting them to rotate. The right. little girls, it's so <laughs> confusing to them. And free ball and and – you know, so it's a lot of cheerleading. It's a lot of, um, you know, praying that they get their serve. You know, I'll walk back there and talk to them, like toss, stand right in the middle, you know, because if you get that first serve, you got a lot. And so it builds from there. But there is times when I'll still get up and walk back to, you know, a 17 year old who's going to Stanford, Elia Rubin, and kind of distract her if the pressure's getting too hard. Sure. Okay, now we're going to look at that girl's foot to see it there, you know? So I think focusing, but, oh, it's a lot of work on rotating. Mm. Volleyball is a hard sport for little girls, especially when they start switching and playing specific positions. And so it's, it's a, it's exhausting, but it's fun, exhausting, but you can't shut up. Yeah, I'm sure. Now as a, as a coach and you've been doing it for, you know, a number of years now with a lot of success, what outside of the sport of volleyball do you hope to like teach your girls? Well, I, I love to see that like all these Marymount graduates like go on to graduate college in four years. And I love to hear about their jobs and their careers and their families. I mean, they're, they're um, telling me stories of, you know, running and ne- they're never late and they're always hustling mm. and they don't um, and they show up and you know, bosses love to work for them. They know how to work. And, and at the end of the day, I've seen like, we've had some deaths, uh, like unfortunate deaths. And when I, you see these girls come together for each other mm. in that class, all those teams and that kind of support is, you know, you're building lifelong friendships. And I get to see that later on. Mm-hmm. I get to see now 
with Instagram, everything at the weddings, but it's more the the funerals or the sickness, you know, that everyone is there for each other. So you're building a community and that's the most fun. Yeah. And for you personally, as a coach outside of, you know, success in the sport, what do you get out of, you know, Oh, I, I, they keep, I don't know. They, you know, they keep you young and they keep you, uh, humble, you know, nice outfit or your hair, you know, like it's just, it's joy. You know, these girls bring a lot of joy to the game and, and to see somebody at the beginning of the year who can't make their serve, who can, that's a thrill to me or a play we've worked on, you know, come together. Uh, that's great. You know, my, some of my biggest moments are like the real surprises. This girl blocked a ball. I, I did not think she could ever (laughs) block a ball. I like start tearing up, you know, or that girl just made the smartest set ever. So that I that all that is just fun. Cool. And kind of along that note, as a coach, how do you how do you measure your successes? Uh, sometimes it's just a good practice. Sometimes it's a drill that finally worked. Um, you know, little things. I don't I don't think you can get caught up in the big picture. More of those championships and stuff. That's those girls plan. And almost I it's more relief. Like people are like, you should be so at the end. I remember the last state championship. It was a gr- all the girls Chase's age, my son's yeah. age, and the great, great group. I just felt like, like this whole thing. It was, it wasn't. It was like, okay, I got it because I knew if we didn't win it, they were gonna be s- upset the rest of their lives. Um, so, I don't know. It's more relief on that, and I try to get more focused on the little things. Yeah. As we wind down here, this is something that I like to ask everybody when we finish an interview, but um, for you in your life, what do you think sports has given you? Um, really good friends. And I think it gives you a competitive outlook that some of my friends don't have. So I don't need to compete in the other areas of my life. Mm. I, and I have it, you know, like I'm competitive. But I can leave that there and then the rest of my life hopefully can be, you know, just about supporting and I don't have to compete like the best hair, the best car, anything like that. Mm. I do think that that's, I don't know if I quite answered that question, but a a competitive out uh, somewhere to compete is good. Amazing. Well, Carrie Klein. Marymount High School, currently 27-0, and number one in the nation. Thank you so much for coming on. Good luck with the rest of your season. Was there anything else you wanted to add? No, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been amazing to, uh, to hear your story, to hear about your successes. Con- you know, congratulations, and good luck with the rest of the season. When does the season wrap up for you guys? Well, they're before Thanksgiving. Yeah, you know? so we're and coming so up on it. Our, our senior night is Thursday, mm-hmm. and then we start playoffs after that. Well, best of luck to you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for coming on. Thank you guys so much for listening and watching. If you guys want to check us out on Instagram, we are at Canon Sports. On TikTok, we are at Canon Sports Official. Thank you to Coach Carrie Klein for being our first guest today with the Colin app. If you guys want to check out Colin, we will be live casting all of our podcasts from here on out where you can listen live and call in with any questions that you may have. Thank you guys so much, and we will see you next time.